Hold on. Okay. Got the red dot? Yeah, it's on. Okay. It's on record. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to uh, this little lecture on servo technologies. And uh, we're going to give you a basic primer on the technology developed by John Searle, Professor John Searle. Back in 1946, the first uh, units were built at British Rewinds in London. Anyway, this will also give you a background and a little primer on magnetic motors and drive systems. Now, first uh, off, we have a first slide. Uh, basically, we're going to get to inverse gravity vehicles for our electrodynamic world, and we live in an electrodynamic world. Professor John R. R. Searle's all-electric spacecraft, and more. And that's me, Russell Anderson. And I'm the chief inverse gravity vehicle engineer for Swallow Command, swallowcommand.com for the past uh, six and a half years, and head of R&D and commander-in-chief of Searle Aerospace Inc., uh, recently made CEO of Searle Aerospace Inc. And there's uh, one of the websites, swallowcommand.com, Now, do we believe John Searle? Well, I certainly do. After studying the material and the history for 26, almost 27 years, 27 years about. And there's the photo from the cover of the DVD. We came out with the John Searle story DVD, Brad Lockman Films, in early 2009. Does this man have the answer to the energy crisis? I think so. And there I am at uh, Applied Electric Headquarters, just right down the street here. That's a model of the C-57D Starship from the movie Forbidden Planet. It's MGM 1956. And for 1956, it, it shows that we knew quite a bit about electromagnetic motors and electromagnetic propulsion and the fact that it can uh, has no inertia, therefore it can travel much faster than the speed of light. And there I am with a 1-1 scale model of the P11 that I built here and transported down to Albuquerque, New Mexico for a Tesla Tech 2010 conference. And uh, I don't know if there's a laser in here. Yeah, there we go. It's a nice bright green laser. Oops. I don't know what I did. There we go. <laughs> there we go. There's a green laser. And right around this area here, this track here, is where the drive unit, the Searle effect generator goes. And that's the thing that really flies. The disc body is a frame for control. And this area here, there are 64 flight cells. The basic structure consists of 64 of these struts and 64 flight cells between the rim and the SEG housing. This is the SEG housing. And the device is controlled from the outside. There are switches and solenoids and the light cells. And these rotate, these are the flight cells here. They rotate from zero degrees to 90 degrees and allow control. Normally, you wouldn't need anything to open up on the body of the craft itself. But for FAA regulations, they say, well, what happens if the power goes out if the drive unit fails? Well, the beauty of the SEG driving unit is that it doesn't fail, it doesn't pack up. It just keeps on going and going and going like the proverbial energizer bunny. Now, part one is prominent figures from the world of magnetic motors. Part two, electrodynamic helical gears and vortex-based mathematics. And part three is the Searle solution, which is the solution to all our energy woes in a small or large package. Now, a prominent figure from the world of magnetic motors is John Bedini. And there's John Bedini, and behind him is his magnetic motor. You have conventional coils here and a rotor with permanent magnets. There's a drive battery, and there's also pickup batteries and charge batteries. This will run continuously. 
That looks like an alternator. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. That's that's exactly right. Yes. This is Medini circuit. Now you have there's that rotor, and you have the uh, magnets arranged so the north poles are facing outwards. You have three of them here, and here's a V belt to another rotor with a cam on it, and that cam will actuate this switch at regular intervals, creating pulses. And this is the charging battery that gets everything going, a photo flash capacitor circuit to store the charge for discharge every so often, and there's a diode loop, a magnetic circuit with a primary and secondary. All this is familiar if you're into electrical engineering. There's a transistor, and here's a driving battery. So you have a charging battery and a driving battery. And the motor pulses right here. Pick that up on a scope. Anyway, this will run continuously and keep batteries charged. You can extract electrical energy continuously from this arrangement, from this uh, circuit. Uh, Kohei Minato's magnetic motor. There's Kohei Minato. There's the motor drive unit. This is the magnetic motor. This is a conventional generator. So with nothing more than magnetics and pulsed electronics, you can get free energy also from this arrangement. And there is the figure, one of the figures from the patent. This is patented, and it works. And there's the controversial paranoid motor, controversial because there's uh, questions as to whether it works. I've seen it working and running, and there have been replications on YouTube. It's similar to the Minato motor, and then you have stator and a rotor with magnetic poles facing a certain way. And uh, because forces are always at an imbalance, this will keep running, keep working. And with a V-belt again, you can run this to a conventional generator. There's a figure from the patent. Troy Reed's magnetic motor is very famous. He's on uh, video, free energy, the race to zero point. And he's shown demonstrating this motor that there's nothing hooked up to it at all, but just with magnets, this runs and provides a great deal of torque and all the electrical energy you might want. He runs a car on this magnetic motor. There's the rotor. On the outside is the stator. And it works. He drives a car all over the United States with just this magnetic motor. Nothing else. No transmission, nothing. Now, George Sukup's V-gate motor, there have been a lot of replications of this on YouTube. This is a very simple and accessible design. Ordinary uh, rare earth magnets you can get from KJ Magnetics on, uh, they're right around here, I believe, but uh, you can get them on uh, that's uh, anywhere online, just about uh, eBay. That's a little dark to see, but there's the diagram of the motor. There's the rotor, starts here and then it spreads outward until it's just on this track here on either side. Light poles, light poles repel, unlight poles attract. Just like an electrostatic motor, those unlike forces can be used as a drive to get continuous rotation. Now, you have North Pole, South Pole, or South Pole, North Pole, I forget. Let's look at it again. And there it is. Now, here's a repulsion magnet on top. And again, here's a cam on the rotor to lift this bar up that holds the magnet at regular intervals. And you can start it by hand, and you get continuous rotation. If you were to place coils of conductors, copper wire, around this unit, you could extract free electrical energy, just as if you were dipping a water wheel into a stream. This is the magnetic analogy of doing just that. It will generate electricity by cutting lines of magnetic force with a conductor with those wire coils. And Bruce De Palma is a very famous name in the world of magnetic motor. There he is. He's the brother of movie maven Brian De Palma. 
and this guy's a genius, he worked out the fact that uh, spinning objects have higher energy, they have coherence because they're spinning, but the spins of the, mag the, uh, the atoms, the uh, electrons that are around the atoms, they're orbiting and spinning around the nucleus of the atom. When they're magnetized, they have even more coherence and spin. So if you're just dipping into that water river of coherence and spin, just as nature would. And there's the unit, there's the uh, magnetic motor. It's just a rotating permanent magnet. And there's the unit that it drives, the dynamo, to generate electricity. Now this generates low voltage and high current, so you can generate a magnetic field with this. This is the basic concept. You have ferrite rings, which you can take from speakers, and they're very heavy magnets, south, north, south, north, south, north, south, north. And you have a conducting ring, copper disc. It's basically a variant of Michael Faraday's unipolar dynamo. You can extract negative from the periphery, positive from the hub, and there would be your voltmeter. So you have this conducting disc, ferrite magnets on either side, so instead of cutting lines of magnetic force in a conventional generator, you're just rotating the magnet. This is one of the really effective free energy magnetic devices, and Paramahamsa Tawari in India has done a lot of work with this and demonstrated to the Indian government that it is indeed open unity, which means free energy. There's the De Palma N machine, N meaning to the nth. Don't know how much power you can get out of it, just have to keep building units, and you can get a lot. Now, Joe Newman is a familiar name in magnetic motors. I've seen him on TV demonstrating his magnetic motor. Now, basically, this is a very, very long coil of wire with many, many, many hundreds of turns. I think it's a, either a mile or two miles of wire in there. The pulse of electricity is going through at the speed of light, but because it's so long, by the time it gets to the other side, the polarity has reversed. So you can put a magnetic rotor inside here and it will turn continuously. And it uh, has to do with the gyroscopic action of atoms. And the current moves at the speed of light, but the coil is extremely long. And here's a driving battery. This will actually recharge quote unquote unrechargeable or was thought to be or thought to be unrechargeable alkaline batteries. So Rayovac Corporation financed the work back in the 80s. There's Joe Newman. The US Patent Office refused to give him a patent since the 1970s because they said, well your patent violates all known laws of physics. But it really doesn't once you really understand what's going on in physics, it's not esoteric, it's just how nature operates. So they wouldn't give you a patent. There are thousands of patents, thousands of them, that uh, if they were released, if even a fraction of them were released, would totally revolutionize, revolutionize our society and free us from fossil and nuclear fuels forever and make a cleaner, quieter, cooler, safer world and uh, rejuvenate our environment and our economy. This is just one of them. Now, Howard Johnson, he has slipped through the cracks. There's Howard Johnson, unsung pioneer. Uh, he got a patent for his magnetic motor in 1978-79, and was featured, uh, so he just died recently, just about five years ago. It was featured in Popular Science and Popular Mechanics. I believe it was on the cover of Popular Mechanics. Now, there's his big rotor, motor, rotor, a working model to demonstrate. It's basically a linear motor wrapped into a circle. Professor Searle's SEG is the same thing, a linear motor wrapped into a circle, so you get continuous rotation. And there it is. And it says, you get a little closer, in this rendering of Howard Johnson's magnet motor, the stator magnets provide the repulsion forces to the armature magnets, which are attached to a rotating drum. As the drum spins, it drives a belt attached to a conventional generator, which is this. The generator provides electrical power. The magnet motor runs on its own. Again, the equivalent of dipping a paddle wheel into a stream, 
putting a belt on it and running it to a dynamo. That's free energy as well. So you have the armature or rotor magnets on the outside, the stator magnets on the inside. When you screw this screw down, you can start the motor and vary its speed. It's a motor shaft, low friction ball bearing, and the heavy duty engine stand. Around the rotor, you have a V belt going to the generator. This is a conventional generator, conventional generator with a V drive belt. You see that all the time in magnetic motors. Now, here's Johnson's helical wave. This is important for understanding what's really happening at the atomic level with these magnets and why you get continuous rotation or motion if it's on a track. You have a little model car with a magnet affixed to the underside and a track, which is magnets. The computer beautifully pictures the spins in the sides of the gate that propel the curved magnetic through the curved metallic magnet through, rather. So you see that. You can animate that in the computer. It looks just beautiful. These are vortexian spins. That's the way nature operates. That's the way particles want to move through the ether or a fabric of space. That's the way air and water also want to move through air or the fabric of space. This picture is the interaction of the curved metallic magnet as it enters the gate. So this, if you animate this, it will show you why you get continuous motion or continuous rotation. Now, toroidal fields. A toroid is basically a donut. And inside toroidal fields, you have, on the top and bottom, vortexian motion. Think of it as inflow winds in a tornado or a hurricane. That's a self-sustaining part of nature. Vortex action is self-sustaining. That's how nature coheres the zero-point energy a vacuum. This is a Fibonacci spiral. It's a vortex of constantly changing curvature. Notice it resembles a tornado or any other whirlpool. See, that's a whirlpool. See that everywhere in nature. That's very important to understanding what's going on with these free energy devices and systems and magnetic motors. Now, what we have here, I'm a musician also, this is a treble clef, this is a bass clef, but it's the spirals backwards on this for some reason. In nature, we have vortexian action that is centripetal. In other words, it's going this direction, outwards to inwards. Centripetal, centripetal action is a falling temperature gradient, and it is basically an action of creation. That's how nature operates. All our systems of energy, burning fossil fuels, creating explosions, internal combustion, looks like this laser is losing a little battery power. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Anyway, centrifugal is outward explosions. Explosions create heat, which destroy. Centripetal motion creates cold, which creates. And we see this everywhere in nature. There's a whirlpool. There's a wall cloud, a tornado about to form under a thunderstorm. On a much larger scale, it's a hurricane. And an even larger cosmic scale, there is a galaxy, a spiral galaxy, very much like our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, Victor Schauberger, who was an Austri Austrian naturalist and scientist, studied vortexian flows in rivers and was wondering how fish, trout, and, uh, and salmon could stand still in streams or even seemingly levitate up into waterfalls which are flowing downwards. He found that they could sense the coldest part of the stream or the coldest part of the waterfall, which was a zone of reverse flow, an anti-gravity spiral, if you were. And by studying that, he developed this repulsing anti-gravity generator which actually flies. At the proboscis of the tornado is a zone of powerful anti-gravity which can lift anything, houses, 100-ton locomotives, anything skyward. 
It's more than just an upflow of rising air, rising warm air. It's an actual zone of negative gravity. Gravity flowing this way, this flows this way at the proboscis of the tornado, and on smaller scale, there's the repulsing Schaumburger generator. Now, you have vortex-based mathematics. If you look at the mathematics by people such as Marco Rodin, you can really understand what's going on. Here's a toroidal coil. This is a light wave in vacuum, in ether. If you figure vacuum is made up of particles so small as to have no detectable mass, something like an ultra-fine gas, space really isn't empty. It's filled with ether, and the silver tube Sagnac experiment proves that. If you figure the reason why light wants to move in this fashion, corkscrews its way, corkscrews its way through the ether, you must figure that on a sub, sub, sub microscopic scale, the light particle or photon has a corkscrew shape on the leading edge of it, which forces it to corkscrew its way through the vacuum or ether. Now, here's a little equation there, or figure there. ML squared over T, with T being time, M being matter, L being length. You have action. 10 to the minus 80 centimeters. That's really, really, really small. So that's what we figure the size of the photon must be. That's a model of a photon. It's coded EM cell. And our DNA and our fingerprints also want to form in that fashion too. Everything in nature wants to form in that way. Now we have the unification coil developed by Daniel and Erica Nunez of onestopenergies.com and they're right up in New York. The path of least resistance is the path of vortex. When you want to move things, you don't have to push them along if you're using a vortex. If you're using things that are designed in vortex in action, the vortex does it for you. It creates a vacuum effect that moves air or water. That's what Victor Schauberg discovered, and that's why it's so significant in free energy devices and systems. You're just copying nature. Now, it's measuring the magnetic flux. Normally, magnetic fields don't extend very far past the conductor, whether it be a permanent magnet or an electromagnetic coil such as this one. But here, this flux meter, it's showing the magnetic field extending way, way out past the lab. In fact, it's set over 17 feet from the toroidal source. And you're still getting deflection in the magnetometer. Let's see, set for magnetic. Now, with electrodynamics and basically understanding of nature, understanding of magnetic motors, and uh, helical mathematics, vortex mathematics, we can construct flying craft, flying craft that uh, are not dependent upon aerodynamics or internal combustion for lift and propulsion. They go way beyond that. And they're much simpler than a jet engine or a rocket engine and its associated hardware. Now, if you want to build a craft that utilizes Electromagnetics, this is the easiest shape to build it in. This is Mark Tomion's Starship Generator. This is a flying electrical generator. And we see that again in Professor Searle's SEG. Mark basically copied the design of Professor Searle's SEG and found that he can have a craft which utilizes electromagnetic force. So this is a patent, June 11th, 2002 a little over 11 years, almost 11 years ago. U.S. Patent 6404089, Electrodynamic Field Generator, issued to Mark Tumian, author of Star Drive Engineering. And I have that book. I've just started to read it. It's quite fascinating. Basically, you have an electrical configuration, negative at the rim, positive at the hub. And we see that again in the SEG, De Palma's end machine, 
There's the toroidal field, magnetic electromagnetic field, very high energy density magnetic field. This craft swims in a sea of electrons. If you figure the ether or space fabric is what A.P. Dirac called a sea of electrons. They're virtual electrons. Virtual electrons house enormous quantities, trillions of harder electrons, which orbit atoms normally. We want those electrons in motion to create our EMF, electromotive, electromotive force, for voltage and current to drive our civilization. And there it goes, swimming around in the sea of uh, vacuum, sea of electrons. So that's just being pushed and pulled by electromagnetic forces? Yes, because all forces act in pairs. That's correct. Now, huh. uh, Tommy's electrodynamic field, there's a photo or a diagram from the patent. These parts are electrically isolated. This is basically a flying generator. All such craft are nothing more than flying generators, flying electromagnetic generators. There's the rotor and the various parts to support it. And here's a graphic of one of the models that were built to demonstrate the principle. Now, Mark to me is electromagnetic, electrodynamic rather, field generator, 700 volts DC to 660 volts AC, power inverter, 228 of those total required. This is a 20 foot dynamo, or 20 foot, uh, about 7 meter diameter dynamo, which is your flying craft. Heat exchanger of liquid sodium. It's a power plant, a simplified power plant designed for a 256 megawatt electrodynamic field generator. Net output, 240 megawatts, 94% efficiency, that's really good, at 132,000 volts AC. 201 distribution transformer, and a multi-stage flash distillation loop. It's a reservoir, inductor, conductor. And here's one of the models in use. Notice the ionization glow indicating extreme high, extreme high voltage. Rest in peace, Mark. Did a fantastic job with this technology. This technology, because it has no inertia, like Professor Searles unit, when energized, can go faster than light. It doesn't get heavier the faster it goes, so it should be immune to the light barrier. And you ride around in a bubble of normal space. Because space is a very elastic medium. That's one of his most amazing properties. You can bend it, twist it, compress it, rarefy it, do whatever you want with it to get from place to place much faster and safer than internal combustion rockets. He was only a few years older than I. Just died recently also, like Howard Johnson, 1957 to 2009. Rest in peace, Mark. Wonderful work. There's the logo of American Anti-Gravity. I've been friends with Mr. Tim Ventura for about, uh, oh, I guess 11 years. He's uh, one of the big uh, researchers and cheerleaders of uh, anti-gravity propulsion, which is really, when you understand gravity, you understand that it's nothing more than an aspect of electromagnetism. Atoms that make up our bodies or any matter are basically negative and positive charges, and the neutrons in the nucleus are protons with a tightly bound electron with a net net uh, neutral charge, so everything is electrodynamic. All matter and energy. According to a recent American anti-gravity interview with Mark Tomian, Mark John's work, that's Professor John Searle's work, was indispensable when it came to the whole configuration. I studied John's work for many years. Mark Tomian's patented functional star drive generator relies on vacuum electrons to create a dual hemi toroidal electrostatic discharge through electronic means. The SEG, Searle Effect Generator, accomplishes its electrogravitic propulsion through permanent magnetics, Searle magnetics. Now, next section, ah, there we go. There's the crowd logo of my company, parent company, Searle Technologies. I am CEO of Searle Aerospace. Uh, Fernando Morris is CEO of Searle Magnetics, and we have a couple other divisions too, ground transportation division as well. 
I'm the flying side of things. It's my passion. And there's the logo for the IGV. I'll go back uh, to that. The inverse gravity vehicle. And this is also a generator of artificial gravity. Searle Aerospace Incorporated, I'm CEO. That's the swallow. And there I am talking to my boss, Professor John Searle, who's still working very hard in England right now, Glastonbury. And he's going to be uh, 81 years old uh, next month. And that was at the Tesla Tech Conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we lectured together. It's the greatest honor of my life. Now, the numerical system, well, the system that he came up with to build the SEG came to Professor Searle when he was a young boy from age four, four and a half to age 10. And a series of two oddly repeat, recurring, repeating dreams they were the same dream, they repeated two times every year. Now, what came from that, he realized, was a numerical system. Later on, when he was working at British Rewinds when he was a teenager, uh, he heard one of the engineers talking about two squared. Well, two squared is four. Instantly, the meaning of the dream became clear. If you have a matrix, four verticals and four horizontals, if you have the number sequential, you get all different outputs, all different sums, from the verticals, horizontals, and the diagonals. But if you randomize those same numbers, again, think of the random action of the ether or zero-point energy. It's going all over the place. It's black holes and white holes channeling electrical flux into our dimension at millions and billions of times a second. That's all random. If you randomize, this is a model of that, randomize these numbers, the outputs all of a sudden of the verticals, horizontals, and diagonals are all uniform. This is coherence, cohering the zero point energy. And we see this again and again in nature. Oh, if I go back to it, this is a light wave model of this. You have all the colors of the rainbow coming in, making white light. And you can also have a magnetic analogy of this, a magnetic prism. And that's exactly what we have, a magnetic prism cohering all those colors into a single uniform frequency. Now, you have, again, vortex mathematics. Here's a toroid, or an electromagnetic coil. The lines of magnetic flux, or, or ether, magnetic fields are nothing more than ether currents, are going in and then out. Again, think of inflow winds in a tornado. The reversing direction in the middle there. These would be ether vortexes. You can also have cubes as well as squares. Now, there are three, and only three groups of squares. Group one consists of all odd numbers. So group one is half of all numbers. The action of this is rotation. Group two is oscillating. Group two consists of all even numbers that are divisible by four. Again, the square has four sides. That's oscillating. Group three is rotating and oscillating. You have an oscillation except for the center cross, which rotates. Group three consists of all even numbers that do not divide evenly by four. The SEG technology uses group two. Now, you can use these squares to get exactly the number of grams or whatever unit of measurement you're using of uh, volume, depending on what volume you want to fill with generator, of elements. You need a basic number of four elements to get a rotation. And I'll explain more about that. There's a larger diagram of that. You just plug in your numbers once you understand, understand the square theory. Highly recommend you go to Professor Searle's books online and look at square theory. Now, what happens when you bring a magnetized runner or roller to a magnetized plate? This element is your magnetized layer, iron. What happens is you get a wave phenomenon. There's a sine wave going one way on the runner and a cosine going the other way on the plate. 
when those two intersect at 90 degrees, they form this sine wave, which wants to rotate these roller magnets or units are carried along in the troughs of this sine wave. Because forces are already imbalanced, this imbalance creates the rotation. You have four elements, a rare earth, the inner element has to be a rare earth, that's your electron reservoir. You have a plastic material which acts as a gating valve to smooth out the pulses, otherwise they would build up and then dissipate, build up and then dissipate. Back in the day he used nylon 6-6 with a negative charge. Nowadays we use Teflon. This is the magnetized layer. It's magnetized with a DC combined with an AC coil to create an unconventionally shaped magnetic field. Pinpricks of magnetism going all the way around the plates and all the way around the runners. And a copper or aluminum layer. Now we use copper as a power magnetics layer to create eddy currents so that they, the runners float over the plates. There's an air gap. No physical contacts. There's no friction at all. No wear and tear on this machine. So you have a collector of electrons. Neodymium. The great thing about neodymium and other rare earths, they're at the bottom of the periodic table of the elements. They have lots of electrons, maybe two or three extra electrons in their outer 4F or 5F band shells. And uh, they want to readily give up electrons, to balance electrons, and they greedily, these elements, these elements, rare earth elements, greedily suck up electrons from the environment. Electrons are everywhere in the environment, and as aforementioned, even vacuum is a state of pre-electrons of staggering value, staggering. So, uh, electron collector, a gate of Teflon, dielectric, very good dielectric, smooth out the pulses, an accelerator of electrons, which is the magnetized layer, magnetized with a special DC AC coil, and an emitter, which is conductive copper, which creates the eddy currents to float these rollers over the plates with an air gap. Very important. Creates interesting effects. Now, unlike a conventional magnetic field where you have a bow tie effect, the magnetic lines of force, if you place a magnetic film over them, the plates and runners, will look like spokes on a wagon wheel. These are gears, magnetic gears. They're not gears made up of solid material. They're gears made up of magnetic fields. But the gears are not straight up and down. They're held like helical cut gears. That creates even more balance. So this thing just wants to keep rotating, wants to rotate. Now, these are magnetic mock-ups, not the actual law of the squares SEG, but it demonstrates why this arrangement works. It has that special magnetization. And there's your sine wave on a scope, a rotating SEG serial effect generator unit, single plate runner gyro cell. Now, what's happening in the actual law of the squares SEG prototype, which we're endeavoring to raise money to build, is you get a field of, whoops, go back to that, a field of electrons or ions, negative ions which are moving outwards in this pattern here. At high rotational speeds, the air pressure is lowered because the electrons keep pushing the air away and you have a vacuum envelope which surrounds the unit. Now, nominal SEG consists of three concentric rings or plates and three concentric sets of runners. And the runners normally consist of eight stacked disks joined magnetically. It's a very heavy unit. It weighs a lot. It's very extremely massive, even the small units. There's your sine, cosine, intersect. Basically, that's a two-phase motor, but with magnetics instead of electrics. It's nothing more than simple processes we use every day, but arranged in an ingenious fashion. There's the nominal serial effect generator, three plates, three sets of runners. Think of it as a linear motor wrapped into a circle. 
Now, there's the servo effect generator, or SEG, fitted with pickup coils. Now, any generator, you can generate electricity by cutting magnetic lines of force with a conductor, and the electricity travels along the conductor to its source. Now, what you have here is you can either move the magnetic fields or you can move the conductor. In the SEG, you move the magnetic fields. Now, this doesn't just generate electricity by cutting lines of magnetic force because of the nature of the SEG, electrons are created and boson pairs, Cooper, Cooper pairs actually, Cooper pairs are creating bosons which move outward and into the coil, gaining energy through each layer. It doesn't just bump up the electrons in an atom to the next shell and then drop down to ground state emitting energy. They actually insert electrons into the coil windings. This is cold current. It doesn't heat up normally in a conductor. You get heat. With this arrangement, you get the opposite of that. You get negative resistance, which creates cold, a land of cold. Again, remember Victor Schauberger's technology, cold, implosion technology. Implosion in that you get a spiral of electrons, which are hungrily attracted to this inner positive layer of neodymium. The periphery right here is negative. Again, very similar to De Palma's drive and system, magnetic system. This is for domestic use. You can power anything that runs on electricity with a Searle effect generator. And there are ferrite uh, SEGs, basically magnetic ball races for creating high torque. Now, this is a letter from the Department of the Air Force to Professor Searle back in the 70s. Uh, Dear Mr. Searle, I have the responsibility for U.S. Air Force propulsion and energy conversion research and development. Interest in Europe and uh, interest in Europe are presently located at the European Office of Aerospace Research and Development, London, England. One of our Air Force organizations in the United States has requested a copy of a report apparently authored by you entitled quote, disc-shaped type of flying craft, unquote. If it is possible to send me a copy of this report at no charge to the government, I would appreciate it. Or if you would prefer, I could copy it and return it to you. Either way, we would like to have the opportunity to acquire a copy of this report. Most sincerely, George Uli, Major USAF Engineering Division. So you see that the interest by the United States government was very high. Now, there is a graphic of the Searle effect generator. Uh, basically, the Searle effect generator inside the inverse gravity vehicle, rather, <laughs> the inverse gravity vehicle. The uh, early generators, the first six, were lost because they would just simply speed up, speed up, overload into a corona surrounding the SDGs, and then they would be repelled from the Earth with irresistible force, even breaking 60 ton tethers, nothing could hold them down. Weight was not a factor, lost all inertia, became super cold. What happens when you overload the SCG in uh, complete opposition to what happens with normal generators? With normal generators, the more load you put on them, the more they heat up and the more they slow down until they eventually stop when they're overloaded. The exact opposite of this happens with the Searle effect generator. It's operating on the principles of an energy or negative energy, dark energy, I guess, which pervades our universe. It's also called ether or zero point energy. The more load you put on the SEG, it speeds up and gets colder and lighter. And when it's overloaded, at, it's about four Kelvin, the neodymium starts superconducting, becomes a low temperature, or actually a high temperature superconductor, and uh, it loses all inertia, and anything attached to the SEG will lose all inertia and be repelled from the Earth with irresistible force, great force. This is about a 35-foot diameter single-seater fighter craft. At the rim, you have a discharge pin. Electrons like to be discharged from very sharp points. And if you want to adhere to curved surfaces, that's what you want in this type of craft, an electrodynamic craft. What you also have inside the craft when it's fully energized at flight voltage, which is figures about uh, 10 to the 12 volts, which is about a terabolt. Whatever the voltage 
the current stays at 1.5 milliamps. High energy electrostatics is the same thing as a gravitational field. And indeed, when it's fully energized, there's no feeling or motion from inside whatsoever. The only thing you feel is one half gravity. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you only weigh 100 pounds on board the uh, energized SEG IGB craft. Now you have these landing legs that fold down. They're a good distance because here is a zone of positive attraction. You don't want that to come too close to the earth because if the drive is switched on, it will just pull up a chunk of earth or whatever it's resting, wherever it's resting, right at the center is a zone of attraction. At the rim is a zone of propulsion. Nothing can get through that field. And there are about three or four different kinds of fields. There's an electrostatic field which ionizes anything approaching the rim, which would then repel it. There is a dynamagnetic field, a rotating magnetic field, which also would uh, magnetize objects approaching the room to the same polarity, repelling them also. So uh, you've got several different high energy force fields surrounding this craft. But inside, you're in the eye of the hurricane, you're safe. Now, this is a graphic done by Ryan Hopkins. This is the Cerro effect generator. Here, this would be a small model, say the size of a P11, about 10, 11 foot diameter. These are the flight cells for controlling the SEG so it's not lost to space, and the rim discharge pins. It's very pleasing to the eye, aerospace craft. There's another cross section. Basically, two isosceles triangles placed together. Again, sharply pointed at the rim, so you get maximum electronic discharge from the rim of the craft. That's what you want in this type of propulsion, that shape. If you want to make a craft that utilizes fields of artificial gravity produced mag electromagnetically, this shape seems to work the best or the easiest. And we see that again and again in real life. 41, 42 of these were constructed, ranging from three foot down or non-returnable uh, models to uh, 10, 11 foot, up to 41 foot models with uh, ham radio on board, a 12 meter ham radio. It's one of the few frequencies could, that could get through. Normally, these craft are radar invisible. They're very stealthy, stealthy craft. So you'd have a pinger on board to track it. Now, here's another graphic with the Searle effect generator, SEG, another graph of the IGB craft. It's a pretty simple craft. Think about the SEG, you have either 64 of everything or 128 of everything, and all the parts are uniform of those 64, 128 of everything. Now here's a model under construction back in the day. Very simple, lightning poles to reduce the weight. There's a uh, I believe that's Gordon Goodfellow working on uh, 21 footer Demo 1 craft, which was deliberately built from uh, plywood, one of the softest materials available, to uh, silence detractors who said that the craft could never support its own weight with all the energy produced and all the uh, everything that uh, the forces that were involved. But when it's energized, there's no force at all on the unit. Everything goes to zero. No inertia. You know, build up of inertial mass. There's the last craft built, the Demo 1, 21 footer, 7 meters, some of the crew building it in Berkshire Wood, uh, Berkshire Wood, uh, Berkshire Wood, England, on land owned by the late Alfred, Alfred Fleetwood. There's the structure being built. There's Tony Justice also building it. This was very heavy. When it was finished, it weighed, I think, about 12 tons. There's Tony and Susan Justice. There's William T. Sherwood and his wife Rhoda from the USA, who are also on the building team for Demo 1. Building the unit, flying unit. Now, it had clear shells on top and bottom to show that there are no batteries inside, but uh, really, when you think about it, what batteries could generate a trillion, a trillion volts.
Anyway, this craft weighed 12 tons when it was finished and flown. There's some colored pictures. It's Reverend Nicholson, Susan and Tony Justice working on finishing it. This is basically a model of what a man craft would look like. Inside would be the cabin, controlled cabin, everything. Now, a man craft, you need a life support system. Anything over 500,000 volts to a million volts, no air can come near the device. But 500,000 to a million volts is on the very low, low, low side of SEG IGV voltage at idle. So you have to have a life support system for mancraft and NASA and ESA, European Space Agency, and the Russian Space Agency is very expert at providing life support systems for craft and space stations. So Professor Searle approached them in the late 60s, and Dr. Arthur Kane became a team member from teams from NASA, and he worked on these craft also. And there's Tony Justice and Professor Searle when he was about 40, 41 years old. That's the top of the cabin, eight-sided cabin, top. And working some more on it. Now, there's one of the ferrite sections, the magnetized ferrite sections, being uh, measured with calipers. Back in the day, all the parts have to be extremely precise. And we're talking about measuring electrons flowing through the unit to the very electron. There's no room for error. There it is, almost finished. Clear shells on top and bottom with a fine wire grid to carry the electronic charge on top and bottom. Starport Earth 1, Berkshire, Berkshire Wood. Flying Saucer Man plans four pound a day trips to Australia. That uh, was one of the uh, articles in the Hansenberg's Gazette. In England, there's a model, a small model of the SEG, uh, IGB with its flight cells. Professor Searle, back in the day, looking much younger. Still working, it's young in spirit. The guarantee, this is the P-11 flying Warminster. Most of the models were flown in Warminster, England, from this open field. And Warminster became the UFO capital of Europe because of that. This craft is P-11. It's about 10 foot diameter, 3 meters diameter. It weighed about 4.5 tons. 4.5 tons. So it's pretty heavy, about uh, the same weight as a normal aerospace craft. Most of that weight is the SEG driving. No noise, no pollution, no heat, no vibration. No consumption of Earth's oxygen, as you would in an internal combustion engine like a jet engine. No need to carry fuel. No need to carry fuel and oxidizer. This is not an impulse rocket drive. This is a warp drive. No runways, no launch pads. We are the tomorrow people, the decision makers. Each and every one of us are the tomorrow people. Tomorrow's transportation today, we can have this today. Development and research by the Searle National Space Research Consortium, UK. 1968, this was the plan to develop such a vehicle for commercial use for, commercial use for deep space applications and exploration. Who knows what the future holds? It may still become reality. Well, if I have anything to say about it, Professor Searle has anything to say about it, it's going to become reality this decade. Now, there's the P-11 again in flight. They're not worried about that thing falling on them. It just, it can't crash. Once it gets a certain distance near the ground, the field produced by the craft, the combined gravity fields produced by the craft and the gravitational field of the Earth cause it to repel. Actually, the Earth, the ground, contains a negative charge of billions of volts. But just like the unipolar dynamo or the SEG, the Earth has an outside negative charge, positive as you get toward the center of the Earth. So, if you have a negative charge coming off the rim and a highly negative charge coming off the ground, you can imagine that this would cause repulsion from the rim and traction from the hub, which is what they see. If the drive is switched on suddenly, it'll actually lift off with a chunk of side sticking to the bottom of the hull. Mr. Sir.
Israel expects to offer day trips and be serious to the moon. That was the plan, and it's still the plan, and it looks more and more like this is going to happen. And this one is a smaller, non-returnable model, with no rate of control, up and out of sight very, very fast. What happens is they get up to about to the height of a certain amount of treetop height, maybe 80, 90 foot, with a pink corona surrounding it. And then they just speed up, speed up, with the corona getting brighter and brighter and brighter until it almost looks like a fireball. And then they really accelerate straight up, straight up and out of sight very, very fast. Sort of landing legs, landing strips. There's the P-11, or one of the P-series craft, photographed at flight by another P-series craft, about a half mile up over Warminster. It's the ground. Landing legs extended. These were non-retractable landing legs on this model. Instead of four landing legs now, Professor Searle wants eight landing legs to better distribute the weight of this very, very heavy craft. This weighs, again, about four and a half tons. Most of that weight being in the drive unit, the SEG. Now, there's a graphic that our team did of an inverse gravity vehicle. You have these flight cells which open up, they flip from 90 degrees, from zero degrees here to 90 degrees here. And what happens when they open up, they have a solenoid inside a shaft, inside a hollow shaft, which fires a hard rubber pin. This is the SEG housing right, right here. A hard rubber pin that the SEG through a hole in the SEG housing. Bang. And just like touching a gyro, this part of the craft or the SEG is forced to drop at a certain angle. And if that drop is maintained, like a helicopter, very similar to a helicopter, the craft will fly out rapidly in the direction of that tilt. Now normally, you don't need to have things that open up on the surface of the body. But say you know something extraordinary happens that really not never happens, and the SEG stops, you have a power out glide, and these could be thought of as 64 rudders for aerodynamic control. But what happens in a power out glide condition with this craft? It falls down like a falling leaf motion, like a pendulum this way, if the drive is switched off which really never happens due to rim discharge pins. Now, they reverse polarity also if these are activated. These are now positive, or actually no charge coming out of here, negative all around the rest of the disc and the other discharge pins. Here's the center column. That's where all your avionics uh, controls, your sensors, uh, video cameras for view, view plates, and TV monitors would go. And really, you don't want windows in this type of craft, but this is just to give a pleasing, more pleasing kind of look. And these upper and lower shells are electrically isolated and made to take a charge. So normally, positive connected to the positive side, innermost the endymium side of the SEG. And there are four switches in these flight cells that can reverse polarity to the uh, intersections to these upper and lower shell sections. Now, this is, uh, I guess, six photographs taken in rapid succession over that same field, the same uh, photographic session in Berkshire, uh, I'm sorry, not Berkshire, Warminster, Warminster. That's Professor Searle right there first standing and kneeling in front of the 10 foot downer, four and a half ton sort of effect, generator powered craft. Now the craft is just a flight plane, flight, flight frame for control. The SDG is a thing that flies. The IGB or inverse gravity vehicle body is simply a flight frame for control. Now notice when this group of flight cells is open, the disc is pointed down and the craft is traveling off toward the camera. Now, when this group of flight cells is opened up on the opposite side, it flies off to the other side to maintain a stable hover. Again, four and a half tons, 
but he's not worried about that falling on it can't crash. Driving it can't stop. Once it's activated, it just keeps running and running and running. The only thing that could stop it if you discovered by accident on a TV show in Canada was the frequency of an old style TV camera oscillator tube, which basically creates an artificial pole introducing equilibrium into the system instead of disequilibrium, which makes the system run. So that's the closest thing we have to surviving film. The BBC took reams of films of flight, and William Stillings, who was on the radio, uh, Other World Radio, uh, last Wednesday, remembers seeing those films. Other Britishers remember. But uh, back in the 90s, they wanted, the BBC One wanted uh, unbelievable amounts of money for this film. Now, for some reason, they won't even admit that uh, the film exists, which insults a lot of people. So that's uh, another example of an obvious cover-up of technology going on. Technology that can change the world. Technology that can get us to other worlds in a fraction of the time and uh, much safer than with uh, internal combustion rocketry, impulse rockets. And there's another photo of the P-11 uh, type craft, actually that is the P-11. Three meters in diameter, four and a half tons, with the sunlight streaming through one of the open flight cells. Professor Searle, I believe this was 1969, July of 1969. The first flight of the P-11 was June 30th, ended last day of June 1968. A lot of media coverage. Now, there's some graphics of what IGBs would look like flying near the Golden Gate Bridge. So we can have this transportation system. You can go, it's so fast. It's uh, from hovering BTOL and hovering to speeds far faster than any rocket can achieve. You can go, plus there's no sign, boom. And you can go anywhere on the Earth in 30 minutes, suborbital. There's one of those non-returnable models close up. These landing legs are meant to be kneeling, that's the design, it's like a kneeling bus, so the passengers can get out through the stairwell that's lowered. And it's, uh, so they don't accidentally touch the hull, because if you accidentally touch the hull before it's discharged, it would be fatal. Another graphic of the servo effect generator. Now, Professor Searle, we call him the man who saved tomorrow. He's my boss, he's also my friend. Now, here's before we start using this technology, and here's after. Would you like to breathe this air and drink this water? Or would you like this? We can have this. We're going to have this. And there's the inverse gravity vehicle, very pleasing to the eye, aerospace craft. If you want to build a craft that utilizes electromagnetics, which is artificial gravity, for propulsion, this is the easiest shape to make it functional. And we see that again and again and again. Particularly since the 1940s. And there it is, in orbit around Mars. You get to Mars probably in anywhere from a day or less. This system is also superluminal. It's FTL, faster than light. It has no inertia. The faster you go, it has no inertial mass. Inertial mass and gravitational mass are two separate entities. Relativity assumes they're the same, they're not. Inertial mass is solely dependent on net charge, not mass or density or amount of material mass. Inertial mass is solely dependent on net charge. This is a highly charged body. Now, because it has no inertial mass, you don't get heavier as you go faster and faster and faster. So the speed of light should not be a barrier to a vehicle propelled by such means. In fact, because of its energy level, it easily fulfills all the requirements for the Alcubierre warp drive system or warp drive bubble, warp bubble calculations, which uh, recently surmised are no more than the mass equivalent energy of a Voyager spacecraft. 
which is very, very low, the spacecraft were pretty light. And this is a high energy density craft. So these are starships. These are all several craft are called starships. This is mankind's first starship for exploring the universe and our Milky Way galaxy. We're finding all kinds of planets, some Earth-like, even with our, within our local vicinity. We can be going there, relieving our population of pollution problems with this flight means. This is the gift to mankind from men, uh, pioneering men, such as Nikola Tesla, who first came up with this concept over a century ago. Nikola Tesla was the father of our entire electronic civilization. Professor Searle and Mark Tumia also gave us this technology, an electrified flying craft. Think of Otis T. Carr also. And that technology is waiting to be reawakened also. Now interest in this type of technology is very high. The time has come. We're ready. And there's a logo of my company. I'm CEO of Cerro Aerospace Corporation. The swallow. Seek with all learning. Love overrules war. Swallow. A better tomorrow for all now is possible with Searle technology. And these tangential technologies was like also elusive, which you can look up online with a few aspects. Now, in loving memory of Nikola Tesla, Mark Tomion, James Howard, Mary Macaluso, BCC, and all other dearly departed advocates of human sustainability. And special thanks to Professor John R. R. Searle, my boss, Team Searle, Bradley Lockerman Films, BKM Films, SDKM3, Ryan H., Ryan Hopkins, Kevin Ballmer, Derek, uh, Daniel and Erica Nunez of the Unification Coil, Jason Hughes, Mark Petrie, the Tesla Science Foundation, there, right here in Philadelphia, AmericanAntiGravity.com, and you, the builders and supporters of this movement. And that's, that's the uh, slideshow. And now I have uh, an excerpt to show you from the John Searle story. Uh, let's see if I can uh, get out of the slideshow.
The generator is approximately two foot diameter by about eight inches high, and it can be put in the home to power your, your home. It can be put in your automobile to power your automobile. If government said, they know about it, but they think it's a novelty. Many of the uh, third world countries have no means of generating electricity. These units could be put in there and power whole communities. You really have to take a look at each individual component and function. And when you step back, you say, wow, this thing works. There's too much for it. To, uh, there's too many fences involved not to be something viable. I found that the big generators, the power stations, were a waste of money. Uh, would present, present to us vast pollution problems in the future. But the whole idea was to get something simple, not difficult to produce, and produce electricity. Well, the series of coils attached to it, we can supply a home or an automobile or any device you want that runs on electricity for at any voltage or power that you require. This particular device actually emits electrons. It does so through an exchange from a rare earth to uh, lighter elements as it goes out. It's also amplified. And as it comes out, you have a tremendous abundance of electrons which are actually pumping into the coils instead of just bumping them forward a notch as a conventional generator would do. The primary component is a rare earth, and it can be, although it can be any of the rare earths, the component that we use is neodymium, as element number 60 on the uh, periodic chart. And that unit puts out an excess of electrons for some reason and it will also replenish them very easily. Well, I've been playing with this with equipment I've uncovered a lot of things which I suspected but couldn't prove. Clearly, the magnetic field was completely different to the magnetic fields we knew of. We've got fields at right angles. That's why the, the whole thing moves. If you have got two fields, it won't move. As we go through the electrons, the mind goes from the middle of the day and the little areas of the So we know that the magnetic field can be set to perform functions. The electron flow is accelerated to an extremely high rate and it creates a vacuum around the device. And in that vacuum, you develop numbing cold. And numbing cold, as we know today, is a function of superconductivity. And also, which is, has not been known, a function of gravitational force. Here we had something we couldn't understand. It wasn't doing what I wanted. That's what it generates I wanted. It will dive down in temperature at one point if you build it correctly and actually levitate and actually lift off the earth, developing its own gravitational field. This thing wanted to fly. So to me then, the easiest thing was to work on a body. Let it fly. And we toyed with this down in Warminster where we built these, uh, what was labeled UFOs. We call them lefty discs. But we built it. Now, 13 old age men backed that project, and they only backed me on the following condition that I did not go commercial with this. They didn't want any problems with tax man. They were doing this for fun. But to me, that was all right. It was giving me a chance to experiment. We have had at least 41 flight vehicles to date. Yes, they've been tested, and the offer we now make it, we are guaranteed will fly. And made it quite clear to them it was not a UFO. The government knows it's identified, they know what it is. Every government knows what it is, and only for years. Here behind me, you see the illustration of something similar to the effect that happening around the solar effect generator. This energy is all around us. It is like this battery. We have electrons pulled to one end 
so that we can make them flow in a particular manner. If we take a plate and we make our roller like a battery, that just make it different, that it takes this energy into this, it will then rotate around this plate. Not only rotate around the plate, it also rotates around its own axis. This was made for the Washington Conference of Future Energy in uh, Washington, D.C. a few years back. It had no, it no intention of anything moving that wasn't intended. Or we wanted to prove that the scientists were wrong, you couldn't get 12 magnetic units to stick on that grid, and they would not fall off. We have a plain board here, we've got a plate with no part whatsoever. We have a copper out of surface. What we need to do, we've got to somehow get power from here to here. First of all, we need rollers. And we like the lady to have something for any secret batteries in them. No batteries. Just not the metal. What we're going to do is our uh, place to put the roller use back in to not the light off yet. Three, no light off. Four, no light. You ain't shaking yet. Ten, eleven. And the child decides to just go in. No option has taken place. Scientists must be wrong. Now we need to get some focus across there to find out how much power will it take to make them move and if they will fly off. We have got some focus to them to the lady tiny. Try to move to one more move. Wait a little bit. Yeah, on the inner uh, ring, you have to have 
That's the idea. That's the, the idea of the, the domestic 